listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I am your host, Ange, and welcome you to episode number 59. Today's guest, we have Jeff Breedlove back for part two of his series. So if you missed part one, Make sure you go back and listen to part one as well. I hate to tell you to pause and go because you might not come back here. You will, absolutely, because you'll love it. So make sure you listen to both part one and part two. Okay, let's talk about Jeff. Who is Jeff? Well, he serves as the community outreach manager for Commissioner Kevin Tanner at the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Jeff also serves on the board of directors for the Georgia School of Addiction Studies and Regional Advisory Board for the RX Summit. This episode, as I mentioned, is part two, so make sure you go back and listen to part one as well if you missed it. Okay, so what do we talk about between the two episodes? Well, together we delved into Jeff's journey to recovery from addiction and shared our experiences about the deep-rooted stigma and discrimination that individuals with addiction face. We emphasize the need for advocacy and change and how addiction is perceived and treated. We highlight the importance of understanding addiction as a disease and supporting individuals in their recovery journey, as well as the importance of connection and community in recovery. Jeff shares his personal story to highlight the power of sharing personal experiences to inspire and support others. He also explains the role that peers can play in recovery and their integration into healthcare settings. He discusses the need to build a strong behavioral health workforce and advocates for policy changes and advocacy for mental health and addiction. Jeff encourages individuals to speak up and advocate for change in your communities, the power of the voice of lived experiences. We cover the role of advocacy, making a case for addiction recovery, and the importance of participating in democracy to bring about change. We emphasize the need to pay it forward and be grateful for the support received, all highlighting the possibility of recovery and importance of self-love. Finally, by the end of the two-part series, so by the end of this episode, we share our passion for education on the existence of multiple pathways to recovery and the importance of never giving up. Okay, more about Jeff. He is an amazing man. He is super busy. Here we go. Jeff has served as the Chief of Staff for DeKalb County Commissioner Nancy Jester, Senior Staff Member to Congressman Bob Barr in the historic 104th Congress and again in the 105th Congress, Deputy Director for the Governor's Office of Workforce Development for Governor Nathan Deal, Policy Analyst for the Georgia State Senate, He was announced, congratulations, Jeff, as a member of the 2023 Atlanta Business Chronicle Power 10 healthcare list as one of Georgia's 10 most powerful healthcare leaders. He was awarded a personal proclamation from Governor Brian Kemp in September 2023 as an outstanding advocate for peer-led recovery in Georgia. Jeff was also awarded the Eric Allen Recovery Advocate of the Year for Georgia and received numerous recovery leadership awards from organizations across Georgia. He was selected to serve as a volunteer for the G8 Summit on Sea Island, Georgia, and served as staff vice chair for the National Conference of State Legislators on the Transportation Committee as a member of the Council of State Governments, Southern Legislative Conference Committee on Economic Development, Transportation, and Cultural Affairs. That is a tongue twister. He's an amazing, so amazing. Jeff also served as a Georgia State Director for the American Council of Young Political Leaders. He was a former Georgia State Director of Sister Cities International and a City of Atlanta Sister City Commission member. Jeff served as a Commissioner and Assistant Scoutmaster with the Boy Scouts. 
He served as PTA president at Imagine International Academy and vice president of the PTA at Maynard Jackson High School. Jeff is married to Catherine, and they reside in Grant Park in Atlanta. They have a son, Lawrence Foster Jack Breedlove, who was born in the People's Republic of China. He is a person in long-term recovery with a passion for sharing his story so others know recovery is real. Okay, enough of this. I know you're excited to hear part two. But first are three C's of engagement. The first one, click that subscribe button and the notifications and the love, the like, the five stars, everything to make sure you don't miss out on future episodes and share this with your friends and those around you. The second C, commit to staying for the full episode. And I want to ask if you didn't listen to part one, commit to going back and listening to part one as well. It's very powerful. And then our final C, well, of course, it's coffee. So fill up your coffee, sit back, relax, and let's get started. So I do well, want to hear how you found your recovery. I'll to tell you that before tribe. we get serious. So I tried out my run, outrun my disease and I wound up in Sacramento and um, in, in Los Angeles, um, Alhambra, for those of you that, that know L.A. So one thing I miss, I got to tell you, in and out. I miss in and out. <laughs> I, I don't do, like in and out. <laughs> I do miss that. Uh, have one for me before you leave. Okay. Um, okay. I'll send you, I'll text you a picture of it, Jeff. Right. Right. <laughs> but you know, you're so right about that. And, and this is a brain disease and isolation is incredibly dangerous. And, um, you know, that is the worst thing for me is to, is, is to isolate. Cause when I get up in my head, I was so sick that, um, and I, one, one of the counselors at Mar is a guy in recovery. And so I really connected with him after, I didn't, but then I did. But um, so he was one that you had like this hate and love relationship with. Yeah, but that's a whole that's a whole episode. (laughs) But anyways, a future um, episode. (laughs) Yeah, but but he's the guy that really saved my life. If one guy did, Matt Matt Irwin, you saved my life. I love you forever, brother. But he explained to me that simultaneously, part of my mental illness. And part of the science of the brain chemicals being out of balance was that I was simultaneously arrogant and and insecure at the same time. Most humans are, and you're a little bit. I was way out of whack for years, and I would sit in a meeting, or and I would think I'm the smartest guy in the room. I got, you know, I, I got the answers. At the same time, I'm thinking. I'm going to say something wrong, and all these guys are going to blackball me out of politics. I'll never get to go to another meeting. It's a brain disease. And, and that's what I was telling myself. But when I started connecting with others and learning that there was other people, I learned that I, I was by no means special or unique and that I, I, I was a person worthy of love and to be loved. And we all are. But that was part of my that was the second part of my journey is my relationship with my higher power. But let me tell you, how I even got there. So. I was so bad. I was so sick that Mar told my wife after my minimum stay at Mar, I, I, I stayed there the, the required time. And they were like, look, Jeff doesn't have to go to sober living because he's so sick that if he goes anywhere to work, he, he's going to use, even if I got, you know, a, what they call a Mar job, like a job at fast food for a while. They're like, he just needs to keep going to meetings. Now y'all we're middle, middle, middle class people. Okay. We have no, Kim, I have to work and I've been fired and I'm facing a felony. Remember that now. Now there's something in the big book. I'm not an expert expert on the big book, but I know this is in the big book. Will the addict or alcoholic go to any length for their sobriety? And Mar challenged my wife and me. And they said, Catherine, Jeff just needs to keep going to meetings. Now we've got this schedule that we want him to work with the sponsor and us on. And she said, well, how long are we talking? And they said, we're talking two years. I thought my wife was just going to explode in the spot. She looked at me. She looked at them and she said, okay. So we're like Brazil to the World Bank, everybody. I mean, for two years, I didn't work. Wow. And, And God provided and family provided, but 
look, I didn't get to go to London for a while or anything like that. And, um, but we did what we had to do. And I got to tell y'all, you get into a rhythm in two years, right? It's working right. things. Oh, what is all this work you talk about? I just go to meetings all day. Well, then Mar says to me, towards the end of that two years, it's almost been, it's not quite two, it's been about a year and seven months, year and eight months. They're like, uh, y'all come back in, it's time for a meeting. And we're like, okay. And they go, now it's time for him to get a job. So he needs to start getting a job. But they're like, you're not going to get one of our MAR jobs. You're going to go back to work in your industry. But now listen, y'all. One of my doctors, my roommate was a doctor, and there's protocols he follows with the Medical Association of the state, and he can go back and operate on hearts. Hey, no big deal. One of my roommates was a Delta Airlines pilot. Hey, you follow some protocols with Delta and the FAA, and you can go fly a plane again. Y'all, and that's Southern there's no protocol where you sign some documents in government and politics and they say, hey, the former crackhead can come back and run the campaign and the, op the opponent won't say anything mean about him because, you know, he signed a piece of paper. So I'm looking at them like, you people don't know what you're talking about. This is politics. They're going to, no one's going to hire me. No one's have anything to do with me. I'm a crackhead to them. And the head of the man of the program, Doug Brush, just is like, Jeff, you're going to make calls. You're going to get a job. My wife is like, and my, so my wife's like, Jeff, you're going to make calls. Or you're going to go find a new place to live. So, <laughs> my She's father, like, my being the perfect angel and saint is now over. Unless right, it's time to get a job, son. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So let's get serious. So I start making phone calls. And like anybody else, I call the people I think would be the easiest to call. I mean, I had hired... Dozens of people as a campaign strategist, a chief of staff. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of people owed their career to me. I made the choice to hire them. And now they're in positions to hire. And I thought, some of them will hire me. I got no after no after no. All over the place. I mean, hundreds of no's. One person said yes. That they would help me. A person's name is Chris Carr. Now, Chris Carr happens to be the attorney general of the state of Georgia. And he said, Jeff, I'm going to help you get a job. And he said, I got some recovery leaders I'm going to be speaking to, and I want to introduce you to one of them, and I want you to come, and I'm going to talk to some recovery leaders, I'm going to introduce you to one. Now, I thought when he used the word some, that might be a dozen, two dozen leaders in a room. I was nervous enough as it is. Well, Chris Carr, my best bud, Attorney General of Georgia, he lied by omission because what he didn't tell me was the some recovery leaders was called Addiction Recovery Awareness Day, or we could say ARAD in Georgia. It's the largest recovery event in the state of Georgia, and that year was 2019. It happened to be that there were 750 people in this room. That's I'm, an expanded version of some. <laughs> and, I, and I almost left. Because I was going to meet him there, you know, and, and, and I didn't I didn't know. And I got really nervous. And y'all, I, I really hadn't been to a lot of places in the past two years that wasn't a recovery meeting. And, and, and I really got a panic attack. And I'm like, this, I, I'm out. I'm like, but I didn't. I stayed. And Chris introduced me to the executive director of the place that I now work, the Georgia Council for Recovery. And um, I didn't know. I didn't know that there was this whole recovery community. I didn't know there were advocacy organizations that 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 did work, that put peers in, in, in places so that the peer voice could be in businesses and hospitals and that, that they did training to train peers and that they need Can you define because I think a lot of our listeners don't know what like peer to peer support is and that yeah, kind of well, peer to peer I'll, certified here. So let's define it. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. But let me just wrap that part yep. up. So so the executive director says, I want you to come be my advocate. And my communications person. And I want you to go to Washington and Atlanta and all over Georgia and all over the country and all over the world and, and, and argue for peer-led support for recovery. And so, again, that isolation that I had told myself, there'd be no place for me in government or politics. Who would hire somebody? Turns out there's this whole recovery community, everybody. And out of those 29 million people in recovery that the federal government tells us, 
in every state, there's thousands that are living the recovery out loud in every state. And they go to, to, to events and some of them advocate and some of them just go hiking and, and go to sports games and, and, and do yoga and do whatever. But they're connecting and living their recovery out loud. They're not all policy geeks like me, but, but there are policy geeks and we're a community. And I didn't know that. Even having gone through treatment, and I finally asked Doug Brush, who was helping me, and he said, you're going to, I said, Doug, why didn't you just tell me about Neil? Because you know her. Why, why didn't you tell me about the council? Because you know them. He said, Jeff, you had to find them, and they had to find you. And God put it together at the right time. And so, that's, and so I've been advocating and doing all this stuff for the past five years, seven years of recovery, two years. I'm not doing anything except going to meetings. And so I learned about peers, and what, and what peers what is a peer? A peer is just a person with lived experience. Now, another word for peer, everybody, is survivor. A person, I love that. a person who's been, I say blessed, some say lucky, but a person who's been blessed to survive the disease of addiction. And we stand on the shoulders. And, and every day, everything we do is to honor the memory of brothers and sisters who, who we've lost to our disease. Even if it's, if it's just going to a ball game with somebody else. Or even if it's advocating and testifying or anything in between, we always honor our brothers and sisters. But we celebrate those of us that have been allowed to be survivors. And so recovery, we live it out loud. There's this whole community. We call ourselves peers. And I will tell you, there's just a movement going on in America, in the business community in particular, the faith community and the education community, to bring peers into those places, into the workforce. I'm going to give you a Georgia example of what I mean by that. Right now, in one of the counties on the north part of Metro Atlanta, it's called Hall, H-A-L-L. -L. It's, it's a very nice county. Um, they have a very large hospital there with four satellite campuses. Okay, they go up into the rural part of northeast Georgia. The main, the main city that the main hospital is in is called Gainesville. It's, it's your typical big city hospital. Well, they have an a, a emergency department and a NICU. So the concept was born. A bunch of advocates came together. The council got to be a part of this, the Georgia Council for Recovery. I was supposed to give shout outs. So the Georgia Council for Recovery is on social media, everybody. Uh, and so am I. Um, but the council gets to run these two pilot programs. So in the emergency department, we have men and women who are peers. And they integrate in the ED. In the NICU, we only have women for obvious reasons. Um, when the pilot program started, the doctors and nurses, to say the least, were less than excited and less than receptive. What are you people doing bringing these people in to our setting? And there was, you know, some standoffishness. It took a year. And the head doctor... And the head nurse came to the people involved and said, we'd like them to start attending our staff meetings now. This is wow. wonderful. Instead of just being off to the side, we want to bring them in fully. We want to fully integrate these peers. Now, what, what does a peer at a hospital do? Well, I'll tell you what they do. Every state has a, the ability. The federal government runs a, a peer certification program. Each state does yep. it differently. There's 50 different versions. They got to follow some guidelines appropriately so, but each state can have their own program. In Georgia, the Georgia Council for Recovery does it for our state authority, who does it does for the feds. But anyways, we do a training. It's very competitive and peers get certified after they go through the training and they have to keep their CEUs and all that stuff. It's a certification. And in the beginning, a lot of jobs and places weren't really using it. Now, we're having to expand the program because so many jobs are saying we're not going to hire somebody without it. We want to hire peers. And the governor of our state and Commissioner Kevin Tanner at DBACD, our, our state authority for behavioral health, they're pushing as, as Georgia tries to grow the behavioral health workforce and have a workforce that can help mental health and addiction. We got our state leaders saying peers have to be part of the Georgia solution moving forward. So peers are just people who get some training. So they have some certification that they can go into a professional setting and provide a professional service. Um, every state has them. Georgia has over 1,100. Texas has more than we do. We are eventually going to catch Texas. California, you know, 
they're doing a good job. They got room to grow. And I, I hope that the, the governor and the General Assembly will grow that program in California because California certainly needs it. And, yes. and there is room for growth in California. But, um, but peers, in my opinion, let me tell you what happened at the NICU at Northeast Georgia Medical Center in Gainesville, Georgia. In the NICU, when the program started, the average length of stay for a mom with substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder diagnosis was almost 30 days. Almost 30 days. Now, y'all, I'm no hospital administrator, but that's an awful lot of money that the hospital and the taxpayers are paying. Now, the average length of stay for a mom in that NICU with SUD and alcohol use disorder is less than 10 days. It's single digit numbers. So not only are we making life better for moms and their babies and their families, we're saving the hospital and taxpayer money. And that's been attributed to peers being in the workforce. The doctors say it, the nurses say it. So now the state's got Emory University. It's not Georgia Tech, but they try over at Emory. <laughs> They're doing their best. Uh, they're doing well, I'm their- a biomedical engineer, and biomedical engineering is a split department between Georgia Tech and Emory. So I have loyalty to Emory as well. Okay. So kudos to Emory. Kudos to Emory. So and Emory's I love doing- Robbie Valenconda there, so I'll give a shout out to him there as well. Right. Emory's doing one of those serious academic, medical, scientific studies to, to validate the findings so that, so, that, so that other hospitals in Georgia, and we hope other hospitals across the country, will bring peers into those NICUs and into those emergency departments. And here, and here's a real story, not a stat. So there was, there's, it used to be very common for the sheriff's department and the police department in Hall County and in Gainesville to be called to the hospital. Because here's, here's the scenario that would play out seven days a week. Mom's out there. She's pregnant. She's under the influence of something. Uh, she maybe already has a baby or two. Maybe she's got a, a, a defects, a, a, a Department of Family and Children's Services case. I don't know what they call it in your state, but that means the feds are all up in your business with your kids. Or, I mean, the state's all up in the business with your kids, and your kids may or may not be taken away from you. So moms worry about that stuff. Mom comes. She's she's in the hospital. She, she wakes up. She realizes that she's hooked up to a gurney with some IVs in her hand. And, oh, she's also handcuffed or not handcuffed maybe, some moms have literally gotten up off that gurney and run out of the hospital because they don't want defects to take their baby. I'm not saying they're they're well and in, in their right healthy mind. I'm just saying these things have happened in the real world. Well, of course she doesn't get very far and of course she's pregnant and it's, it's not healthy because they were afraid of going to jail because they'd already been told you go to jail one more time, we're taking all your babies away from you. So what happens? It's up to the discretion of the law enforcement officer. But she hasn't hurt anybody, let's say. She hasn't really, maybe it's just public disorder. You know, she hadn't robbed $10,000 in the local store. Now he can talk to the peer and the doctor. And if the peer says, I can help them, the sheriff's deputy or police officer can leave. But the peer will talk to the the mom and say, if you give us your word, you're going to work with me. You're not going to go to jail tonight. In fact, they're going to leave. And we'll get you treatment. We'll get you help. We'll get you into recovery. I'm not saying, you know, it works out 100% of the time. I'm saying it works out about 80% of the time. That's an astounding statistic. Because moms want recovery. They want to get better. And they don't want to go to jail. It's amazing. So what happens at night? Well, the officer doesn't have to do a big report, just a small report. And they don't run her through the jail. Did you? the justice system again. She doesn't get more attorney's fees. She can't pay. She does get to keep her family. I'm not saying DFACS doesn't know, but now they know, oh, she's in this this special program for treatment. Okay. So she gets a chance and we break that criminal justice cycle and we get that medical cycle going. And y'all, that program can work in any hospital, in any NICU, in any emergency room, in any place in this world. So there are exciting solutions for behavioral health programs out there. And I am proud that Georgia is on the cutting edge of so many of them. Um, And the Georgia Council for Recovery does lead the way with the state of Georgia. We have a pro-recovery governor in Brian Kemp 
Let, can I brag a little bit? Yeah, go for it. Let me brag. Um, sure. And I'll make sure we send this straight to Governor Brian Kemp. That's Absolutely. So listen, in Georgia, lo- let me brag about us, and it's bipartisan too. Let me be very serious. So at the General Assembly of Georgia, we have a mental health caucus, bipartisan, four co-chairs, two Democrats, two Republicans, 100 members, Senate and House. We have a General Assembly working group on addiction and recovery. Some overlap in members, but but different members in both, four co-chairs, two Democrats, two Republicans, Senate and House. Look at that. I got a core group of about 150 members of the General Assembly in Georgia talking about mental health and addiction every day of the General Assembly. Well, that's powerful because it's bipartisan. It's not Democrat, Republican, blue, red, conservative, progressive. They're like, this is the one issue we will agree on. Well, that that gets the governor going, hmm, maybe there's something to this. So what is our governor allowed? Well, first of all, he signed a bill that passed the General Assembly where Georgia on car, there's, there's thousands of these on cars. We have an actual license plate that says Georgia recovers and recovery is real. So just everybody knows those specialty plates, your favorite college team or save wildlife, and that's all great. We've got one in Georgia that promotes addiction recovery. That is amazing. We think we think we're the fifth state that had one. So not many. Most states, you could get this passed. It could be bipartisan. And 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 and, and there's a little fee for specialty plates, and those fees, guess where they go in Georgia? They go to the Georgia Council for Recovery for Addiction and the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network for Mental Health. So the money raised for that special plate goes right back in to peer-led recovery for mental health addiction. So we got a license plate on cars, and there are thousands of them. And then we have three programs that Governor Kemp has done that he's funded out of, out of his budget called Georgia Recovers. And these are peer, these are recovery programs. It's not a prevention program, like just say no, or this is your brain on drugs. Those are important. And I'm all for prevention programs. Don't get me wrong. But every state does those. But there's not been a single state, and I challenge every state, to do a recovery program, validating that recovery is zero, validating that anybody can get into recovery. And so Governor Kemp has spent over $3 million on three, three rounds of this. We've done everything from billboards to videos to geo-targeting on smartphones for commercials that people can just click a link and find out where there's peer-led recovery in their community and their part of Georgia. So we've, we've, and that's been, by the way, the coolest part of it. I love the videos and I love the billboards and that those are great. But this geo-targeting stuff is where it's at. Yes. So, so we've, we've had these programs. We just launched a program last week. WSB TV is the biggest TV channel in Georgia. WSB is running commercials with peers in recovery, 15 peers. I got, the, I had the privilege of being a part of setting this up. We have 15 peers who taped 15 different commercials talking about how people in recovery can trust the 988, new, the new 988 number. Oh, I love this. And now they're running. WSB made a big donation. Uh, Commissioner Kevin Tanner at DBACD and Governor Brian Kemp made a big donation. And so we got the reality is we've got commercials running all over Georgia, 15 peers across Georgia. They look like Georgia, the diverse, and, and, and their peers telling peers, our family members or friends, hey, if there's something going on, you call 988, they're going to hook you up with some crisis intervention folks, and, and, and we're going to save lives. So our governor and our General Assembly has passed those things. But the biggest thing we passed in Georgia, and now I'm going to tell you how bad it was in Georgia, is in Georgia, was in Georgia. Any, any academic poll on behavioral health, Georgia would be last, sometimes behind Washington, D.C., 51st. I mean, there's only 50 states, and we're 51. So you got to really work to be 51 out of 50. And um, that means you're making D.C. look good. So that's hard. <laughs> And I lived there, but it's hard. So that's a joke, but it was a very serious thing. So our state came together. We formed this commission, the Behavioral Health Reform Innovation Commission. And these people have been working. They worked through COVID. Um, They worked virtually, but they didn't quit. They kept working. And we've come up with some policies that we've passed into law 
to reverse all these years of Georgia being at the bottom of every survey done by every objective academic institution, no partisan group, we were really bad with mental health and addiction. I'm not saying we're number one today, but I'm saying we moved from 51 up and we've got more bills coming. The commission works. We've got D's and R's working together. We've got a governor saying, come on, work, find solutions, find solutions we can afford. And I'll tell you what our number one project in Georgia right now is across the board. We've come to realize as a state, we can build all the buildings we want. We got to build a workforce that's trained and ready, that's peer positive. And so what, what we've got a governor and a general assembly and a commissioner, Kevin Tanner, doing is finding how do you build a workforce? How do you take outdated laws that, that, that are outdated licensing laws that make it almost impossible for somebody to move from another state to your state? And how do you make it easier for their license to transfer from Alabama to Georgia or Indonesia to Georgia? Well, we're working on that stuff because sometimes you mean bio. like a behavioral health workforce, right? right because right. that's oh, one of the right. things we talk about it. Medical workforce. Yeah. How do you get because listeners? I think one of the things that you might not know. So being on several boards at Georgia Tech, at Georgia Tech, just like UC Davis, we're very passionate about trying to figure out how to make a positive impact in mental health in the entire community at Georgia Tech. So staff, faculty, students. And one of the challenges that we have is trying to find behavioral health specialists that we can hire because there are not enough individuals that we can hire to fill the roles we want to to do that important work. Right. And so it's a combination of, of a state government providing funding, local governments providing funding, federal government providing funding, and, and this is the important part, the business community buying in, the law enforcement community buying in the medical community buying in, the faith community buying in and saying, yeah, we're going to change the way we view mental health and addiction, behavioral health, if you will. And we're, we're willing to make changes. We're willing to change outdated laws. We're willing to move funding from somewhere else over to a medical issue, killing more people than anything else. And by the way, if you happen to survive the barriers to say, go to college, the barrier to get a job is almost impossible. So how do we take a holistic approach from every part of society and say, we've got to change outdated things and have the political courage and the social courage and the faith courage to put new things into place that maybe we've never done in our community or our state. But when you do that, I'll tell you what you do. You do a couple of things. You save lives, you restore families, you build a stronger workforce, you reduce the dropout rate, increase the graduation rate, you get people back into their houses of worship, and you make communities stronger. That's what happens. And we're seeing that in Georgia. I'm very proud of that. we got a long way to go. We're seeing that in other parts of the country, but that's got to happen everywhere. I mean, I don't care if you're President Donald Trump or President Joe Biden. I don't care if you're Bill Clinton or George Bush. And I don't care, by the way, in Congress right now, there's over 100 members in the United States Congress of the Bipartisan Congressional Mental Health and Addiction uh, caucus. And I appreciate all 100 of them. And I know all four of their co-chairs. But I want you to understand this if you're listening to my voice. There's 535 members of Congress, 100 in the Senate and 435 in the U.S. House of Representatives. And only 100 have joined a caucus to stand with us. So odds we are... We need everyone. Right. Odds are you're a member of Congress Odds are hasn't joined. And if they have joined, tell them thank you. But if they haven't joined, send them an email and ask them why not. When they come to a town hall meeting in your district, go to it and say, have you joined the Congressional Mental Health Addiction Caucus? If you have, thank you. How can we get to know each other? Let us help you. Have you heard? You need to know. But if you haven't, why not? Why aren't you standing with us? So we need Congress to help us with funding, to help us with laws. You need your governor and general assembly. And most importantly, you need your county commissioners and your mayors and your sheriffs and your district attorneys out there. You may not think government impacts you. You may not like government. But I assure you, in every community, in every state, and at the federal level in America, and the same is true in countries around the world, 
There are people making decisions about our lives every day. And the only thing that's going to make it better for us is if we speak up and show up respectfully and professionally and positively and say this disease is killing a lot of people and we need to help save our lives. And I think Jeff and I can both say that because both of our personal stories are out there in the ether. I used to say I was going to completely write an anonymous book. And I now have laughed in recent episodes because I'm like, now that we're close to 50 episodes, people have almost heard everything that they could possibly learn about my background. And so I have no anonymity left or very little anonymity left. But one of the things I want to tie back to is earlier in this episode, when you said the word earned and I shared openly, I cringed at that. But all you've done in the past several minutes, Jeff, is say exactly, you, you basically put your word exactly to what you said. All the work that Georgia has done is earning that for the individuals of Georgia. And I hope that worldwide, you know, this podcast is watched worldwide. I hope in all networks of the world that individuals start advocating and speaking up and forcing those things to be earned in their communities because the communities deserve it. And the other thing I want to tie to is I love the peer, the reason I will throw this out and If you disagree, listeners, you can put it in the comments and we can discuss it in a future episode. But I will say that the reason the peer-to-peer is so successful is that for an addict to sit sit next to someone who can say, I have been there, I can share my story, there is nothing more powerful than that. And that is... That is so much better than someone sitting with a doctor who they have that white coat syndrome with the doctor, right? So it doesn't matter how much you trust your doctor. You still have the white coat syndrome. You still hide things from them. This is a psychological, there's lots of studies on this. But when you sit with a peer, someone who looks just like you or someone who can tell your story, then then you can relate and you can find hope and joy that you might not find otherwise. And now we're talking about as well the peers. You know what you're doing for those peers is you're allowing them to stay sober, to stay clean, to continue to grow their communities. So it is the absolute best win-win you could possibly have. It's like using your most intellectually, like your, your subject matter experts. It's using your subject matter experts and allowing them to continue that. Oh my gosh, you hit me. Okay, we are so, listen, peers, and and look, and I say this about family members too, especially a family member that's lost someone to the disease. Not only are we subject matter experts, we're the most important voice in the process. We're the voice of lived experience. Yes. And, you know, I've learned this from folks that that I've been blessed to, to, to learn from who've mentored me. You know, you cannot fix us. You can meet us where we are because I don't care if you're a multimillionaire or billionaire. You can spend all the money you want on your loved one. They've got to be ready for recovery. My active addiction lasted 30 years. The last 11 years, I I didn't want to do drugs. And I would binge once a year and I've had guns in my mouth and at my head. And it's a whole, y'all, I'm a thief. I stole I stole $77 in quarters from my son. I know it was $77 because I took his coins to the change machine at the grocery store, put it in there, took the receipt to the cashier, and she gave me $77. I went and bought crack cocaine with it. I stole from my son. But my son loves me today. I don't care what you've done. Whatever you think you've done. Recovery is real. Redemption is real. Forgiveness is real. Healing is real. And it can help. And and people want to help you. And people want to love you. You're never hopeless. You are a person worthy of love and to be loved. And there's nothing you've done that's stronger than recovery. Nothing. But, Ange, I do want to go back to one thing about that earning it. I want to give everybody an example of what I mean. And some people like this guy and some people don't. I don't agree with everything he does, but I've had the great privilege to meet him and talk to him. And I think he changed America. And I'm talking about Jesse Jackson. What do I mean? So Jesse Jackson, y'all that may not know this, in 1988, he runs for president. 
the Democrat primary. He does not become their nominee, but he ran for president. So good for him. But he had a group called Rainbow Push Coalition out of Chicago. What does Jesse go and do? Well, he comes up with a plan to earn respect for his community, the African-American community. What does he do? He doesn't target Congress. He targets the corp- the boards of directors of the Fortune 1,500 countries in the United States. And he and his members, the members of Rainbow Push Coalition, chapters all over the country, their assignment, like say you're in Atlanta, Georgia, is get to know the board of directors at Coca-Cola and Delta and Home Depot and UPS. Get to know them. Go to their website. Figure out where do they go? Where do they live? What do they do? Get to go know them. And then ask them, what is Coca-Cola doing for the African-American community in Atlanta? Are you sponsoring these events? Are you giving out scholarships? Are you changing your HR policy? Whatever it was, that didn't just happen. A group of advocates got together and said, America may not give this to us. We're going to go ask for it. We're going to go earn it. That's what I mean by that. And, and they did. And guess what? It is, it is Jesse Jackson that changed the culture in boardrooms across the world. And now the programs that some younger people uh, 40 years later just take for granted, they happened. They started in the 60s. They manifested themselves in the 80s and 90s. And now they're kind of commonplace in corporations around the world. They did not just happen. Advocates had to go work for that. Make a case. Spend your money here. Have your HR departments do this. And that's what I'm talking about. Instead of just firing the employee that, that, that enters into active addiction, we've got to go explain to the, to the leadership of that business, you know, you're, you're not going to get... You're not going to get sued. There's there's legal protections. You don't have to fire the person because many people say, oh, I got to fire them right away or I'll get sued. It's up to us to educate people about our disease. And so where I'm not I'm not suggesting we reinvent the wheel here at all. I say we look at medical issues that have gone before us like cancer and, and, and AIDS and, and Alzheimer's. And we look at social movements that have gone before us, certainly the civil rights movement. And we say, did they win? Yeah, okay, they won. Well, what did they do? We got to do that for our disease too. We deserve that. But no one's going to give it to us. We got to get up off the couch <laughs> and participate in democracy. Now, I've had the great privilege to be in some countries. This is international. Look, I've been in some countries around the world, and not as many as you, Ange, by the way. But I've been <laughs> in some. And a couple of times I was there with the State Department, and, um, and I've been to some dictatorships. And, and I've met some leaders of those dictatorships. And look, I'm not here to salt change the world. I'm here to tell you that when you listen to a government leader in a dictatorship, you appreciate democracy a whole lot more. Because there are places in this world where people just don't get any kind of input. America... I know it aggravates us. I know we, 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 a lot of us express that aggravation on social media. Um, but let me tell y'all something, y'all. We're, we're in a constitutional republic, but we call it a democracy, and that's great. We'll use the word democracy. We get to participate in freedom. We get to go make a case. Heck, we can run for office. There's a whole group of people in recovery right now in 2024 running for office. One of them is a good friend of mine in Nevada. He's running for state house of representatives in the state of Nevada. He's openly in recovery, running with that as part of his platform. And, and, and there's a couple of dozen of them around the country. That's what I mean by earn it. We live in a democracy. If we want this funding, if we want these laws, if we want these programs, if we want things in HR departments, if we want pastors to know how to care for us, if we want superintendents and principals to, to not say there's no drugs in my school, but to know how to help a teacher or student in crisis. Y'all, part of being in a democracy is we have to participate. And, and the power of these podcasts is that I hope my voice, if it does nothing else, 
wherever you live. I hope it inspires you to find a peer-led group uh, working for recovery, working for prevention, working for treatment, working for recovery housing, working for harm reduction, working for mental health, something in the behavioral health community. And you join them. Give them an hour a week. Give them a dollar a month. Do whatever. Give them 40 hours a week and a million dollars a year. Give them whatever you can, where you can, how you can. But we need every voice. Because there is that stigma, which is hate, ignorance, and discrimination. And every ally we get needs to know we've got their back. What do I mean by that? I mean that we're going to show up and vote. You, you know, are we're going to buy their, you know, why does Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia, and Delta, and UPS, and Home Depot, and Scientific Atlanta, why do they give hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to the Pride Festival in Midtown Atlanta that touches Georgia Tech. Why do they do that? They could do that to hundreds of festivals. Why that one? Because the leaders of that community have gone to those business leaders in Atlanta and convinced them of two things and two things only. You can help people and by helping people, you'll sell more Coca-Colas, or you'll sell more paint, or you'll sell more plane tickets. you got to make the case that it's a good investment for them. And they go, oh, you're right. If You are. You, you're going to convey our support for you, and people are going to like Coca-Cola, and they'll buy Coca-Cola, so let's, let's, let's help each other. That's democracy, y'all. You may not like it, but that's what it is, and we need you to participate in it and be a voice for mental health, to be a voice for addiction recovery, to be a voice for harm reduction, and just help us and save our lives. So powerful. And I would say if there are listeners that are sitting here thinking, oh, I don't know anyone impacted by these issues. First off, you do. You absolutely do. If you listen to the episode we just released on Saturday, the 27th or 26th, whatever that one was, maybe episode 43, we talked about the stats and how many people in the room were having challenges. So trust me, you do know someone, many, many, many people who are impacted by this. Secondly, even let's just say, okay, maybe you don't know someone. I love all the examples, Jeff, you've given historically, because I would want to encourage people to get into this mindset of pay it forward. I would like to do an exercise, like just close your eyes and think about some of the things that you're grateful for now that you have. Like you mentioned, the ability to vote or the ability to do some of these things. And close your eyes and imagine there is a time in society where individuals were not allowed to do those things. Mm -hmm. And someone paid it forward to you. Someone said, this is not acceptable. And I am going to advocate. I am going to take a, a, either, you know, your volunteer is either your time, your money, your resources, your voice, your hug, your whatever. There are a lot of ways that you can make an impact. Staying silent and doing nothing is not making an impact. But close your eyes and think about some of the things in your life, in your family's lives, your community's life that you are grateful for. And how many of those are because someone said, I want to earn it, okay? And now all we're asking you to do is do the exact same thing in these areas because the return on investment is going to blow your mind. You're going to, not only all the things that Jeff has mentioned, you're going to make better managers, better CEOs, ones that have way more into emotional intelligence, individuals who are way more productive because they, it's okay for them to go to a therapist in the middle of the day. It's okay for them to speak about their time. I mean, at my company here, we have conversations about alcohol and the impact of alcohol on your brain. Open conversations with my employees. We talk about Andrew Huberman's, we talk about these things, right? So pay it for it. Think about what someone else has done for you. And if you do nothing else, and if you're like, I don't have the time, then dedicate, like you said, a dollar to some organization that is going to take the time and fight for this because every single individual is absolutely worth it. So I, I want to say that is amazing. So is there something you really hoped, Jeff, we would cover tonight that we haven't covered yet? This has been so amazing. I can't wait for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, I think I think what I would say is two things. There may be somebody listening to this podcast somewhere around the world who's in active addiction. And they say, okay, Jeff, it worked for you, but it's just not going to work for me. Well, I was you. I mean, look, y'all, I've done some cool things in politics. From the floor at NASA, met the Pope. I mean, really cool things. I got to adopt a son. None of it. it look, the disease doesn't care about any of that stuff. It's just a disease. There's no cure for it, but it can't be treated. Just like diabetes, I want you to know that. No money. Doesn't matter about the money. When you're ready, you can enter recovery. You can. I did. And you're gonna if you if you will if you will let yourself, wherever you live in this world, there's a recovery community. And you just gotta Google it. Just Google recovery community and wherever you live, and something's gonna come up. And if it doesn't, and I don't know if you're gonna put my Social media I will clips somewhere, but yeah, I'm all I will. over social media. It's really not hard to find me and you can message me on social media and I will personally help you find either a treatment place, a recovery living place or, or a recovery place wherever you live on this planet because it's there. So you're not alone. I want you to hear that. And now, if you're a loved one that's got somebody in active addiction and it's tearing your heart out, and you're feeling some pain, I got some news for you. You can't fix them. You just got to meet them where they are. You don't have to enable them either. Stop enabling them. It doesn't help them. Find somebody. If you don't know anywhere else to call, call 988 or call this number, 844-326-5400. Eight four four three two six fifty four hundred. It's toll free. It's run by peers out of Atlanta, Georgia, and they will give you some place somewhere to get a resource. And you can find resources for your loved one, but you're not going to fix them. You just got to meet them where they are. And I do want you to hear me. They're good people with a bad disease. And don't let their disease fi- define them to you. I know they've hurt you. Just meet them where they are. And then if you're a person in recovery, early recovery in particular. Y'all go meet that recovery community. Go do those fun things. Yes. It's not about staying sober. It's about living life. Live it. Embrace it. Go have fun. I've had more fun the past seven years than I had the first 50 years. And I did a lot of cool things the first 50 years. (laughs) But it's, but here's the difference. I'm a, I'm a conservative white guy from the South, y'all, who now understands what it means to stop and smell the roses. I used, now Ange has out traveled me, y'all. I'm a little bit jealous of her. We're going to have to <laughs> talk about that later. But I just wanted, I've got a map in a room near me, and I was just consumed with putting a pen in another place. Now I want to enjoy the place. That's the different mindset. So embrace, find out what it is you like and go enjoy it. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And the second thing I want to say is this. I cannot tell you enough how it's not just about policy. I know I talk a lot about policy, but recovery is much more than just policy. And these recovery community organizations, very few, I'm their policy guy in Georgia. I mean, they might come to the Capitol when I ask them or whatever. But y'all, it's all about art and sports, and uh, yoga, and and fun stuff. So understand, when, when I talk about recovery, I talk a lot about policy, but most of it is fun stuff. And it's almost like a fraternity. may not be a cool Georgia Tech fraternity or sorority, <laughs> but we try. And let me tell you what I mean by that. When you have the strength to open up to our community, you never know if the person doing the hiring of that company is a person in recovery looking for people in recovery because they know how strong we are. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so embrace your community. It's a network. 
and we lift each other up. A rising tide lifts all boats. So embrace your community. Don't be ashamed of your disease. Be proud of who you are. The number one thing that I will tell you is this, recovery is real. Absolutely. You know, when I, inter- I've listed this quote in many episodes, when I interviewed Dr. Constance and his book, Brave 52 Weeks, Being Mindful, my favorite quote, and I, ha- I keep looking over at my board because I have it written on my dry erase board because I want to remember this, but every life matters, including yours, start acting like it, mm-hmm. which speaking of favorite quotes, it is a requirement of this podcast that everyone has to share their favorite motivational quote. Did you remember to bring your favorite motivational quote, Jeff? I do. And I, I've already yes. used it with y'all and I'll tell you what it is. Love it. You're a person worthy of love and to be loved. Oh, that's so beautiful. And that's my that's favorite so because a counselor at Mar would walk down a hall to grown men and say that. And I thought he was a freaking idiot. <laughs> I did. I thought he was, yes. was like, you're an idiot. And then I started thinking, well, that's true for everybody but me. Because I still didn't love myself yet. I hadn't forgiven myself. Hadn't connected to my higher power yet. Now I know that, that means me too. It does. And I'm happy about that. I'm a person worthy to, of love and to be loved. And so are you. So that's why it's my favorite quote, because it took me a while to respect that quote and then believe that quote applied to me. Y'all, your life matters. And recovery, and I'll say this too, I I wanted to say this earlier. You know, one thing about recovery is multiple pathways work. Yep. And this is what I've come to realize in the past seven years. I don't think any two people enter into active addiction exactly the same way. No. Why should we have to recover the same way? I mean, look, getting charged with a felony, making Google, the making the Atlanta news for five days, living on Google and going I'll to pass. tomorrow. <laughs> that's what took me to finally say, okay, right? Right. But it doesn't have to be that way for you. And going to a place like Mar may not work for you. Maybe you need something else. And the good news is just like there's lots of pathways into addiction, There's lots of pathways into recovery. So don't let anybody ever tell you there's only one way to recover because that's just not true. Hey, you got to have some integrity around it and all that and on some accountability. I don't think anybody recovers by themselves. That's the whole sponsor thing at work. You need at least one other human being. But hey, look, outside of that, here's the deal. If you can look in that mirror and you're true to yourself and if you have a higher power, whatever that is, that's the integrity part. I do think you got to be accountable to one other human being. Outside of that, find your pathway to recovery because none of us got here the same way. We don't have to recover the same way. And I will share, listeners, if you go back and listen to many of the episodes we have on this podcast, we talk about a variety of different ways to recover and different modalities and why. And I think it's in episode 13. And also, Joshua and I talk about it in his episode on on craving recovery, why I love treatment centers that include multiple modalities so that individuals can try multiple things in, in treatment and find what works for them, because that's what it is. And so what Jeff is saying is that if you try one path and it doesn't work, please don't give up reach out to Ran, reach out to Jeff, and we can give you a list of additional other contacts and li- a list of additional other things. And if you try one path and it doesn't work, it does not mean you are broken, you are hopeless, and it will never work for you. It just means you're unique and you are special and there is another path towards recovery. I guarantee you, every single individual who's listening to this, there is some path towards recovery for you. I guarantee you. I have yet to find someone that didn't have some path towards recovery. Absolutely. There is some path towards recovery for you. And I just, I really hope you'll be brave enough to reach out to those of us who love you. As we say in some of the episodes, love you until you learn how to love yourself, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you one more thing, Ange, don't let the number discourage you. I mean, this is not baseball. You get more than three strikes. So look at me. It was 30 years of active addiction. The last 11 years I kind of wanted to stop, 
but I tried to do it all by myself, which by the way, was not my, it's the one pathway I do not recommend is by yourself. Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, but I, I insisted to people that I could do it by myself. And 11 times I failed. And then it worked. I didn't give myself one time, two times. I just knew I had to stop this. And so event, don't get discouraged if you say, well, there's no more chances for me. As long as you are breathing, there's another chance for you. Amen. Amen. Well, Jeff, this has been amazing. I am so grateful. Oh, it's been a blessing, Ange. Thank you. What, what a tremendous honor. Thank you for joining us today with your coffee and conversation. We hope you've been encouraged and learned something from today's story. To learn more about today's guest, please check out our show notes for more details. Now it's time to remember to like this episode, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to ensure you do not miss future episodes. Recovery Advocate Network envisions a world where individuals with mental health challenges receive comprehensive and effective treatment without the worry of financial burdens to themselves or their families all without the stigmas often present in society. We are proud that every individual work with RAN does so on a 100% volunteer basis. You can support the mission by making a financial donation via PayPal or Venmo, or email donate at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org if you would like to donate items for our next fundraising auction. Please visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org to learn more. Now, stay in the loop about upcoming events, future episodes, and more by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter X, TikTok, LinkedIn, and all major podcast platforms. As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the hosts and guests' own personal stories and do not represent the opinions of any organization mentioned. RAN is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a future guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org or submit a blog by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. We also encourage you to comment on the episode so that we can continue to provide content that is most beneficial to the community. How do you do that? Visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org And in the top right corner, click that comment button and comment. So listeners, what do you need to do? Pause what you're doing, subscribe, follow us. Please give us a like and a five-star rating, write some meaningful comments, and most importantly, share these episodes with your friends. You never know whose heart you will touch, so please be a part of a reason someone has new hope today. If this episode was triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741 and or if in the U.S. dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're in the U.S. and need additional resources such as shelter, support group resources, transportation, food, and or a safe confidential path out of physical or emotional domestic abuse, please call 211 or visit www.211info.org for assistance. Now, we know you are very busy and we are grateful that you said yes to sharing time with us today. If you stuck to our three C's of engagement and listened to the full episode, then visit the podcast section of our website and leave the comment about the podcast and you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of one of the books from one of our book club series as well as a coffee and conversation coffee mug. So, Thanks again. Until next time, back to your coffee.